Hi everyone, I'd like to thank one of the sponsors of the podcast, St. Romeo, who provide great skincare products for men. I'm gonna show you some of the products. St. Romeo Facial Cleanser, Rock and Roll Face Scrub. And if you had a rock and roll lifestyle, you're gonna need a face scrub. This is their deep cleansing charcoal bar. How putting charcoal on your face cleans it, I have no idea, but it works. This is one of my favorites, the cucumber eye gel. <laughs> Must be for vegans. And they've got heaps of stuff for your hair too. Shampoos, styling creams, and um, stronghold for your hair. <laughs> Obviously, I don't need any of these. I'd like to thank St. Romeo for being one of the sponsors for the Joe Avati podcast. Hi, this is Joe Avati, and today I am in Melbourne recording my podcast series, A Serious Chat with a Comedian. Well, you are going to love today's guest. He's known as the human lie detector. He can tell who's telling the truth and who isn't. He's a world authority on it. He travels the world helping all sorts of police agencies help solve mysteries. He's an expert on the polygraph machine and on profiling people. And he's actually gonna give me a bit of a test myself. So without further ado, let's go and meet him, Mr. Steve Van Apren. <music> Steve Van Apron, I'm very excited to have you here, mate. This was an impromptu, really, because about a week and a half ago, you weren't even going to be a guest out here. And then I had another guy, Mr. Ben Price, who said, you've got to get... Because he asked me, he goes, oh, have you got a lot of comedians? And I said, no, the majority of my guests are not comedians. Um, I'm just people who've got an interesting story. And he pointed your way. You've got an amazing story. I'm going to give just one little note, and then you, you continue. You are known as the... Human lie detector. Tell us, tell us about how you got that name. Well, the media actually yeah. branded me the uh, human lie detector. Uh, <laughs> I did a story many years ago for Tara Moss. Um, and oh yeah, Tara. Yeah, yeah. What had happened was um, I started getting um, a lot of requests to do interviews and, mm -hmm. and whatnot, and worked on a number of well-known homicide cases here mm -hmm. in Victoria. Yeah. And uh, one of the journalists just dubbed me the human lie detector as. They do. They love yeah. labelling, yeah. as you would know. Yeah. And it just sort of stuck from there. So we are going to find out a little bit later on in the podcast how you can tell, you know. Like there's the old, oh, if they sort of touch their nose and, touch, you know, the, but there's a, there's a lot more to it than that, which we, you know, we're not going to reveal now. But let's start talking about the history of lying. Why yeah. do we lie? Well... There's been a lot of research and um, we lie for a number of reasons. We lie to get ahead. We lie to impress. We lie to impress a, a potential partner. We lie to save face. Um, we, we call those pro-social lies. Yeah. So Is that a white lie? Is that what they call it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. little white lies. Yeah. Uh, but then again, uh, some of the homicide cases I work on, mm -hmm. um, they're at the other end of the spectrum. So what happens is we, we, we go through the process where – we, uh, you know, we're, as humans, we're social creatures. We like to interact and whatnot. So we often try to impress our friends and, and whatnot. I'm a golfer mm -hmm. and uh, the guys I play with know yeah. that I play golf. So they're very apprehensive about telling me what their score is yeah, right, yeah. because, um, you know, we don't like being caught out in a lie. Yeah. And research shows that not only are we not very good at telling lies, we're not very good at spotting them. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Do you think you're good at spotting a lie? Yes, mm. yeah. I'll put you to the test. Yeah, okay. A little bit later. Yeah, yeah. And, and the reason why I say that is because of what I do. I mean, you know, part of being a, a comedian, I suppose, is to notice the little thing. Look, yeah. I, I, like okay. for example, there was this. I met this couple. They came to a show, and the 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 husband it looked, was a dead ringer for Tom Cruise. Right. right? And I jokingly said, "Oh, how long have you guys been married? Oh, 11 years. Wow. What's it like being married 11 years to Tom Cruise? The wife has been married to to this guy for 11 years. Looked at him and went. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, she never saw it. And I guess as a comedian, we try and see things that no one else can. That's why I said that. Anyway. I, I think comedians yeah. are very good because I do a lot of public speaking myself. Yeah. And what happens is after a while, you, you're very good at reading audiences. Yes. Because especially in your line, yeah. you know, you want to know whether or not the joke or the tag or the punchline hits the mark. Yeah. And often you'll be looking at reactions to see 
uh, what their reaction is. And we, as humans, we all exhibit the same facial expressions of shock, horror, disbelief, anger, contempt, happiness, and sorrow. So if you hit a, a, a if you do a joke, yep. all of a sudden there's the look of disgust in someone's mm-hmm. face, and then you know, hang on a minute, that if the person next to them is laughing, yeah. well, then you you you're very good at picking up those cues and signals. Yeah. You have to because that what that's what makes you a good comedian. Yeah, and and further than that, is sometimes. Because it's dark, the room's dark, and sometimes you know you're mm. performing to three, four thousand people. There is no way you can see at the back Correct. of the room. Yep. The so so it's not just the 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 facial expressions that you're looking at because sometimes you can only see the first two or three rows. Yeah. So I call it the sound of the darkness. What is happening out of that? Where, what, because that's how you determine when you get to the next. Ge- so you're next listening gag. to the laughter. You're listening to the laughter because that determines yep. a couple of things. When do I come in with the second gag? Yeah. Also it determines. Is this a touchy crowd or not? Yeah. Because if they're like, ooh, if they're standing at all at this gag, yeah. well, they're going to definitely not like the one three down the track. True. You know, so that's the kind of things that we, yeah. But, you know, what, what you said is very interesting. So, so people have those looks of shock, disgust, happiness and so on. Now, that's universal all over the world, isn't it? It does not matter where you live. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Professor Paul Ekman uh, did a lot of research into what he calls micro-expressions or right. distress signals, if you like. Yep. So as a human, when we experience uh, a, a, an emotion, yep. it exhibits itself on our face within between 125th and 1/100th of a second, even if we try to conceal it. So often if, um, say somebody is lying to you, yep. what they'll do is they'll spend so much time in, and effort processing how to get that lie across yep. to sound believable and credible. They're paying no attention to what their facial expressions and their body language is, in fact, displaying. So body language, I'd say I can lie with words, but our body language is often more overt. Yeah. So what I – and I I try and, you know, intelligence agencies, uh, homicide detectives, uh, uh, you know, Department of Defence, all sorts of, you know, special secret (laughs) government agencies. And what I say to them, the very first thing is don't look at yourself as a question asker. Anyone can do that. Mm-hmm. Look at yourself as an analyst of human behaviour. Right. So when I did my training with the FBI, uh, one of their things is they say there's no such thing as a bad interviewee but there's definitely such a thing as a bad interviewer because they don't ask the right questions. Mm-hmm. So if I'm interviewing you for a homicide yep. and I want to know you know, where you were or what you were doing, say, at the time of death last night between 6 and 7 p.m., yep. I'm going to ask you questions. Now, I can't... you. You cannot possibly pre-anticipate every question I'm likely to ask you. So you have to think quick on your feet. Mm -hmm. Plus, truthful people, what they do is when they're recalling a memory or historical event, they'll be able to tell you what they heard, what they saw, what they felt, the conversations that took place. Why? Because they're recalling a memory, unless there's brain trauma or head trauma. Sure. Whereas a deceptive person, for every one lie they tell, they have to invent another two or three to protect themselves from the first one. So they've got to have a great memory, but... They don't want to contradict what they've previously said. Now, we know through science when people are lying or creating false memory, it takes a lot of cognitive load and it becomes really difficult. So I'll ask Mm. you questions, you know, where were you last night between five and six? I went out, where did you go? To a restaurant. What was the name of the restaurant? What time did you leave? What time did you get there? Who did you go there with? What was the name of the restaurant? Have you been there before? That's an important question because if you haven't, uh, then you're not going to know. If you have, you can then make it up as you go. What did you order? Can you describe the layout of the restaurant? What was on the menu? Describe the waiter. How did you pay? What time did you leave? Now, yeah. if you're making all that up, that's a lot of yeah. uh, cognitive processing, yeah. whereas a truthful person will usually be able to tell you what they did from back yeah. to front. Uh, they'll be able to tell you how they felt. Yeah. Deceptive people, if they're lying about being there, uh, not only do they have to lie about that, then they have to lie about how they felt about not even being there. Yeah, you're right. Or... Yeah what I call lying twice, if uh, let's say they're, they're saying that they were there, who did you speak to? What were some of the conversations? Mm-hmm. So now you're lying twice, lying yeah. about being there yeah. and lying about a conversation that never took place. Yeah. So I think if you don't ask a good, clear, direct and concise question, it allow a deceptive person to yeah. room to wriggle out on. Yeah. And, of course, then you can then go back and interview the waiter, supposedly, Correct. who was there. Yep. And you can say, was this person there and what did you talk about? Yeah, so I'll yeah. corroborate it. Yeah. I'll look for alibis. Yeah. I'll look for inconsistencies in their story. Yeah. Um, I'll look, let's just say they said we went from here to here and I know they've had to go through a toll gantry or something. Mm-hmm. 
well, then I'll look for corroboration. I'll go through that, yep. look at the record, see if that's in fact the case. Yep. You you catch someone out lying in little lies, they become bigger and bigger and bigger mm-hmm. and they have to lie to protect themselves, yep. especially if they don't want to be involved in something. Yeah. Now, I might, you may or may not be able to answer this question, I don't know, but is where does the where does the memory of of a truth experience get stored in the brain and where does a memory of bullshit get stored? Like when, when you're making stuff up, where is that coming from versus where have you got a, a true memory stored? Do you know? Yeah. So when uh, a person is um, uh, processing a lie or telling a lie, yep. it, it comes from our uh, pre-cortex, uh, our frontal, pre-frontal cortex. cortex yeah. So that's where a lot of evaluation analysis takes place mm-hmm. because we have to think it. Whereas there's another part of our brain uh, where near the uh, amygdala, the where, amygdala yeah. where yeah. actually uh, recalling information from past events. And the reason we can do that is because a memory from the past stamped with an emotion becomes either a short or long-term memory, mm-hmm. right? And we're accessing like a data, yeah. uh, like a, um, you know, um, a spreadsheet or, or database, if you like. We're recalling information from that. So it's two parts of our brain. Yeah, right. Now... When do we start lying as a kid, right? I'm assuming. You know, we, we, we talk us a little bit about the diff, the lies as a, as a kid versus the lies as an adult. You know, because a lot of times when kids lie, they they kind of make it. It's, it's obvious when they're lying. Yeah. So it's really interesting. Um, do, you, do you have young children? Or I've have, got have, yeah. I've got a nine year old and yep. I've got a two year old. And boys or girls? Boy and a girl. Okay. So when your girl was young, say mm. two, mm-hmm. um, and let's just say she went to, or well, three, and she went to lesson, ballet yeah. lessons yeah. or she dressed up as a fairy. Yeah. And she really believes she's a fairy. Yeah. Is that a lie? Well, I'd say mm. no. And no. I'll tell you why. A lie by definition is where you willfully mislead somebody knowing that what you're saying is factually incorrect. Right. So... Um, that would be like I say something that I know that I'm telling you is wrong or false. Right? Now, if a child really believes, if your daughter believes mm-hmm. she's a fairy, yeah. technically she has to understand what the concept of a lie is yeah. to engage in it. Mm-hmm. So um, it gets to a stage where as we, we through social development, children, we all lie, but children yeah. lie as well. Yeah. The difference is um, the, the methodology behind the lie. Children's lies are very simple, mm-hmm. right? Because it's not a lot of cognitive. Yeah. But did you yeah. eat that biscuit? No. Yeah. Hand to the yeah. face, masking, like you said, yeah. masking concealment or blocking behaviors. Yeah. Very and most parents can tell when their yeah. kids are lying like that. Yeah. Um, when we get older, we have uh, the ability to minimize, justify, rationalize. People often say to me, Steve, who do you think make the best liars? Uh, politicians? Mm. No, politicians are terrible. Mm. Politicians get caught out all the time. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you this question. So who yeah. does, mate? Um, in my view and yeah. my experience, yeah. uh, pedophiles. Pedophiles sure. are very good at manipulating their victims, mm-hmm. their treatment providers and everyone else in between. Mm-hmm. So they're very adept at living that lie, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, and they're very good at minimising or rationalising their behaviour. I remember when I was a detective interviewing you know, several and yeah. they would always come up with some justification for a behaviour. You know, I remember I interviewed one person. And um, he said, oh, you know, uh, this girl dressed up very provocatively. Mm -hmm. She was seven, Mm. right? So this is their rationalisation or justification. So, um, yeah. And look, even though, you know, they're very adept at, you know, manipulating people, um, there will, in my view, there will always be telltale signs or what I call leakage or seepage Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I don't care how good you think you are at lying. Mm. Sooner or later, you're going to trip up. Yeah, there's going to be a mistake. There's going to be, yeah. and and we look for, and we'll get to this in a minute. Yeah, we'll get we to look for yeah. several things. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of journalists will contact me and they'll say, mm-hmm. "Steve, I've got a photo. Yeah, um, what can you tell me about the photo?" <laughs> and I'll say, "Well, it was taken in one one thousandth of a second. Yeah, if you want me to be analytical and critical, give me a video, video. Yeah. and listen to so I can listen to the questions, look at the reactions, see the responses. Uh, so we tie the the what people say with the body language. Yeah, yeah, um. Who makes the worst lies, men or women? Oh, without a doubt, men. Why? Well, um, firstly, 
uh, women hesitate less during the delivery of a deception. Mm -hmm. So there's less what we call response latency, less ums and ahs, okay? And also when and we know through research women have more um, evaluation centres in their brain than men. Right. So they're much more fluent at language mm -hmm. at a younger age. Mm -hmm. uh, it was funny, I went to a... Um, uh, a meeting a little while ago, and I was there were six women in that group. Yeah, and one of the things I noticed there were two women talking. Everyone else was mm -hmm. listening. Then there was a breakaway. And there's, so the, now there's two groups mm -hmm. of two, of uh, four women yeah. talking amongst themselves, and the others were listening. Now I'm a guy. I'm trying to focus yeah. on one conversation, yeah. and all of a sudden I noticed one of the women in the first group mm -hmm. hears something from the other group, and she's focused on that. Yeah. And um, so insofar as the hesitations, many less hesitations during the delivery of a deception and um, it's, it's almost like half the amount of men mm. when we uh, fabricate. And the other thing we know about men, men's lies are very basic, extreme. Right. There's not a lot of processing. <laughs> um, you know, um, it, let's just say uh, yeah, where were you last night oh, uh, or why were you late? Uh, 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 the traffic was busy. Yeah. So there's not a lot of content, information, yeah. structure, detail. Yeah. Whereas we found women can incorporate stories and feelings and emotions and thoughts and conversation, all that sort of stuff, and that takes a lot of processing. And it makes sense because, um, like I said, men have less evaluation centres uh, in their brain than women do, and women are better at reading body language. That's why a lot of the time men come unstuck because they think their story is believable and credible, but what they don't pay attention is what they're doing with their body language. So what are you saying? So you're saying so you're <laughs> saying that men are terrible liars. Yeah, I am. But you're saying so then so it's almost like a backhanded compliment here. You're like well, it depends we, on which side you are. <laughs> yeah. So 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 women, you lie. You just better, oh, we all lie. We're, we they're all better lie. at it. They're more, they're more deceiving. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, well, when I say more deceiving, they're, they're, they're better at it. Yeah, uh, better at it. Um, but uh, it's interesting. I think the question should be is why or what are the types of lies that men tell and what are the types of lies that women tell and why do they tell them? See, it's interesting because um, uh, there's research from a study done in the UK. Yep. What they found was men and women lied for different reasons. Uh, women would lie to make somebody else feel better about themselves, whereas men would lie to make themselves look better. So you've got to understand the process and the why. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes down to, um, you know, issues of, um, you know, like fidelity or something, the, yeah. you know, uh, men and women cheat for different reasons. Mm -hmm. So I th I've always said in a lot of the training I do, interview training, I think it's important to understand the motive behind what makes people do what they do. And... Like I said, I've worked on 82 homicide cases and two serial killer investigations. Yeah. One of the things I find is uh, people often won't lie to you. They'll edit the information they supply you with. Right. And there's a big difference because yeah. you think about it, they've got to create or embellish. Uh, so a truthful person will take ownership. Yep. So uh, they'll tell you how they felt. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll tell you what they said, what they did, what they heard but also how they felt, especially if it's like a homicide. They'll say, you know, if I was there, I could have stopped it or, you know, I felt really bad. Whereas a deceptive person can't do that. And yeah. the reason is if they exhibit any type of emotion about how they felt, it could implicate them about being there. Yeah. Yeah, right. Now, before we get on to, like, you know, methods of being able to tell people, like, you know, by, by the face or body movements and so on, um, and, and polygraph machines, let's let's – Take a, a trip down memory lane here. So, so how did you start? You know, what were you like as a kid? You know, we you know, we we're, we're, we're your mates lying, and you're like, no, you're lying to me. You know, do, we, when did you first realize that you had this ability to be able to detect in people whether they were truthful or not? Okay, I don't think it was an inbuilt, um, you know, um, uh, acquired thing. Yeah, uh, it was a it's a learned thing. Yep. It's like. You know, no one was born scared of snakes, spiders, or mother-in-laws. Mm. They're all <laughs> they're all learned behaviors. That's a good gag. So you so you've done you've done comedy there because what you what you normally do is the first one's serious, the second one's serious, and the third one is a gag. So well, pretty think, good there. Well, see, so they're, they're learned behaviors. Yeah. So um, if you can learn a behavior, you can unlearn mm -hmm. a behavior. So what I found, I, I think, if you had to ask me where it sort of come into play. Uh, when I joined the police, I was working with a detective and one of the mm -hmm. detectives said to me, Steve, he says, Steve, I hate being lied to. I said, you're in the wrong job. Mm. People lie to us all the time. That's what yeah. happens. So 
what had happened was I was always interested in psychological profiling, yep. what made serial killers and yep. serial sex offenders tick. Hence the reason why I went to the FBI Behavioural Sciences Unit. And while I was there, they said, look, do you use polygraph testing? Well, hang, hang on a second. Step, step back here for a second sure. because um, we, we've skipped over a few years. So you, you what did you do at school? So um, did, did you get to tertiary level education? Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I finished, or back in those days, HSC. Yeah. Um, and then I went back to university when I was 24 and yeah. studied uh, criminology. Yep. Uh, and sub-majored in uh, abnormal psychology. Right. And then after that, I then, uh, obviously I was in the police at the time because uh, I was in South Australia in Victoria Plus, and then I thought, wouldn't it be great to have the skill sets and abilities to when we work out when people are lying? Because yeah. I found a lot of the detectives I worked with yeah. were not very good at spotting a lie. They thought right. they were, yeah. but they weren't that good at spotting a lie. And research shows that on average uh, our ability to spot a lie is between 48 and 51% of the time. Right. So you might as well flip a coin. Yeah. Now you could ask yourself why is that? Mm. Why are some people better, some people aren't? Well, th th this is why I asked you, you know, when you were young, did you ever th notice anything in someone? Because, you know, some of it, obviously the, 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 the better you get at it and the more you learn, the mm. better you're going to get at it, I should sure. say. But I'll, I'll give you an example. So a friend of mine um, goes out with this guy. I didn't like him from the beginning. She right. goes out with him, goes out with him for a few months. At the yeah. end, oh, he was a nutter. Yeah. I'm like, fucking, you couldn't figure that out when yeah. you first met him? Why could I see it the day that I saw him that this guy is trouble? Now, I didn't have that kind of relationship with her, mm -hmm. the friendship, to be able to say, listen, you're making a mistake here. I, was, I didn't have that. I didn't have that confidence. So, But when she came back, she goes, oh, I just couldn't deal with him anymore. He was like this and like that. And I said, well, look, I, to be honest, I saw it from day one. Yep. Why can some people see that from day one and one, and, and some people can't? Because she was involved with the guy. Right. So what happens is you see these little flaws, mm -hmm. you see these little things, but you, what happens is you dismiss them. And how many times have we been in that situation where people, everyone outside can see what's going on, but it's like the, the, the example I like to use, I remember interviewing a guy for a homicide and it was a brutal murder of a young child. Mm -hmm. And he looked like your typical grandfather. Yeah. I'm expecting a monster. Yeah. Right? And he, so what happens if we are uh, influenced by personality, character, charm. That's how yeah. conmen uh, yeah. and con yeah. women can be yeah. so good at, you know, bleeding people's accounts dry. Yeah. So we want to believe that somebody uh, inherently good. Yeah. Right? So what happens is it distorts our judgment. Now, if you're a friend looking because you know, you're not directly involved, yeah. you can see the cues and the signals that yeah. they're totally uh, oblivious, oblivious to. to. Mm. Why? Because, you know, there, there might be a spark, but all the little flaws. I have a, a friend, she's in a relationship that um, she ended up getting married to this this person mm. and, um, you know, she's a, a, like a fraction of her former self, mm. right? And there's no doubt that she would have never put up with the behaviour the way he treats her now, back then. Yeah. But what's happened is through the process, she could see the flaws, mm -hmm. but not earlier in the piece. It's yeah. only later when they were amplified and, and then we're talking about control and, mm -hmm. um, you know, power issues and all that type of thing. So, yeah, often we can see things, but if we're part of the uh, that relationship, um, we're oblivious. Yeah. So you're in the force... You want to sort of pursue something other than just being a detective. Is that when do you ship yourself off to the United States? Who sends you to the United States? Because you trained with the FBI and you also trained with the um, the LAPD, right? Mm. So trained with uh, trained with LAPD, U.S. Secret Service, LA County Sheriffs, FBI, and so on. So yeah. So while I was in the place, so just going back to your question, yeah. where did it first hit? Where um, I realised that I had really good observation skills. That's yeah. what I put that, it down. That's to. what. Yeah. That's what I'm talking um, about was going to crime scenes. I right. could go to a crime scene. I could tell you in a very short time whether or not it was staged, arranged, whether the offender spent time with the victim post-mortem, whether the victim was moved. Um, and I would look at things and, and I always had the ability, I think, yeah. uh, of observing things that people wouldn't even realise, which I'm going to yeah. express to you, some yeah. of the things you do, and yeah. you're subconsciously oblivious to what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so I had that ability to, to look for those things. And then when I went to the FBI Academy, then it, I really fine-tuned those skills. Why did they have these skills at the time and we didn't? What, what, did, what were they seeing that we didn't see here in Australia? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, I went through two police departments and detective training school and I thought I was an you know, okay interviewer. Mm -hmm. 
I went over to the FBI and, and I also trained in adaptive interviewing and all of a sudden I realised how inadequate my interviewing technique was. Mm. Why? Because if I interview somebody and let's say, you know, um, all of a sudden they their behaviour changes. Well, in the past as a police detective I would put what we call the points of proof to you, uh, negate any defences and that's it. Whereas now um, I will ask you the question and let's say you engage in, you know, uh, distancing language, hand-to-face uh, masking uh, behaviours, uh, you know, um, uh, blink rate increases or decreases. And we'll talk about that later. Mm-hmm. There are a number of things that we engage in and we're, we're not even aware we're doing. So I'll look at that. But then I'll s- listen to uh, is Joe using uh, personal pronouns, either including himself in the conversation or excluding himself? So how people use language is a big indicator of deception as well. And I can give you many examples of that as well. Yeah, right. And so what did you learn there and bring back with you? So I, uh, it was funny because uh, the more I learned about profiling, the more interested I become in cognitive and behavioural interviewing. And they said, do you use polygraph testing in your police department? I said, no, nah, it's very American, very Canadian. They said, oh, look, we use it for frauds, extortions, homicides, sexual offences. Why don't you train with us and you can take the technology back? So that's effectively what I did. So, But tra- was, there po- was there a polygraph machine here in Australia already at the time? Uh, I, I believe there was one. Right. Um, and I also believe he wasn't – that person wasn't actually using validated testing procedures. Right. Um, so I trained uh, there and then come back and um, uh, then I started using polygraph in uh, some of the investigations. But then I realised you really don't need a polygraph – to work out if people are lying. And, I mean, it, it's it's almost like a prop in some police departments. Right. Um, but I, I I found that if you ask the right questions and you what we call baseline a behaviour, which I've already done with mm-hmm. you and we'll talk about that later, mm-hmm. then I'll start looking for deviations from that normative behaviour. Yeah. So I've always said to investigators, if you haven't bench, benchmarked uh, behaviour, how on earth are you going to notice any deviation from that normative behaviour? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so that's what I learned over there. Um, but while I was doing testing, I, I saw similarities and traits in people that weren't, um, you know, visible in other types of interviews I did. So uh, if I'm interviewing you, I ask you a question and the question becomes a threatening stimulus. You're evasive, omissive, dismissive. You don't answer the question. You shift in the chair, you know, you know masking behaviours. Then I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute, what is it about that question that made him feel uncomfortable? Yep. So how do I do that? Well, I'll ask you questions where neurologically I know you have to recall historical events, which I've already done. Yeah. So now I know how you react when you're recalling information. Now let's say you're going to fabricate or create a false memory that never existed. Mm-hmm. Well, then you're going to access another part of your brain, yep. which is more the creative side of your brain, yep. right? And then through questioning, I'm going to highlight any inconsistencies. I'm going to peel layer by layer by layer until you've got nowhere to hide. Yep. And, and with the polygraph machine... What is it that it, what's it, what's it, is it picking up your heart rate? What is it doing that to, to be able to determine? Like I think we've all seen it on in the movies, you know, it kind of goes Dr. off. Dr. Phil. Yeah, yeah. But is that really what, what happens? Is that so it's picking up? What happens if you're nervous? What happens okay. if you're, you've taken drugs and, and your heart rate's gone up? What happens if you had to run to get to the appointment? You know, all that kind of thing. Sure. What happens if you've got a bad heart? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's about half a dozen questions there. Yeah. So um, the – Polygraph testing is predicated on the basis um, that if you deliberately and intentionally lie, it will create um, changes in our cognitive processing yep. and it will induce a change in our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Nervous system what does that yeah. mean in English? When a person lies, they become fearful of being caught in that lie and that's what, how our brain sends messages to our uh, heart. Uh, our uh, breathing and so on. So basically it measures changes in heart rate, blood pressure, blood volume, changes in emotional sweating and changes in respiratory cycles. So answer your question, uh, what if somebody's nervous? Well, what we do, we calibrate the instrumentation to work off whatever level they're functioning from. Right. So I tested someone the other day. They're extremely nervous, yep. yet they still passed. Yeah. So if somebody's nervous, usually um, they're nervous throughout the whole test, not one particular question. And secondly, quite honestly, if nerves affected the result of the test, no one would ever pass. Mm. So we do a calibration test even before we start the actual test. Yeah. Have you ever seen anyone beat it? I say people don't beat a polygraph, they beat the examiner. Because right. a polygraph is simply a, an instrument that records physiological changes at a given point in time. 
uh, uh, let me give you a great example. I am working on a homicide, I won't go into too much detail, but working on a homicide case at the moment and they found the deceased in a dam. Right. Now, if you read the uh, pathologist's uh, autopsy, they could not establish a cause of death. So if let's say there's water in their lungs, well, then we know there's a high probability they drown. drown. If there's no water in their lungs, they could be dead before they hit the water. No, necess- no necessity, I should say, to breathe. So one of the investigators said, Steve, can you ask our suspect if he strangled the victim? I said, that's a bad question. And he said, why? Surely if he killed him, he'd know how he killed him. Mm. I said, yeah, but what if he held him underwater and he drowned? Mm. And I asked him, did you strangle him? He knows dead well that he didn't strangle him. Yeah. He knew, he knew, so he's, technically he's involved in the death but, but he's, he's not, not lying. lying to the question. Yeah. He's going to pass the test. Mm. So if in any test or interview your questions are not clear and concise, it will allow a deceptive person room to wriggle out of. That comes back to bad interviewing. Yeah, right. Um would an actor make a good liar? No, not in my experience. And let me tell you why. Yeah. Um, I run training courses, you know, two and three day training courses. Yeah. Uh, and I tried to get, not tried, I did. I got about six actors in. Yeah. And what I wanted them to do was replicate different facial expressions, such as, you know, shock, embarrassment, disgust, happiness, contempt, sorrow. They could do pretty much most of them. But here's the issue. If I ask you to smile, and let's say it's, uh, how's it going, Tony? Yeah, yeah. That's not a real smile. How do no. I know? Because the obicular, ocular, and zygomatric majors are not working. What does well, that mean? Yeah, well, a real that, smile yeah. engages yeah. the whole face. Yeah. So what will happen is the corner of the lips will pull up mm-hmm. and they'll be crinkling around the eyes, Botox yeah. dependent, of course. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> then I know yeah. that that's a genuine smile. Whereas a fake smile usually occurs from the nose down. So it might right. be something like, that tastes really good. Mm. Okay, but if at the same time I do this, that tastes really good. Mm. So I'm shaking my head yeah. in the negative. So there's a yeah. negative uh, body yeah. language together with a fake smile. It's like mm. a double whammy, right? And so you then come back. You've you've you're armed now with all these all these new techniques that you've learned. And this is why I have no friends at all. <laughs> yeah, right. I was going to say if you had children, but you said you don't have kids because I can imagine your kids. Did you? Where did you put? Where did you lie? And you're like. <laughs> No kid will ever want to lie to you. Um, so, so you you then do you stay in the in the force or do you go out and do your own thing with your new sort of bag of tricks, if you like? So I stayed in the uh, the force for a while. Um, yeah. I actually paid for my own uh, travel over there and all, all right. my own training and, yeah. and whatnot. So it wasn't a burden on the taxpayer. Yeah. Um, and I come back and then after I left, I was in there for a couple of years after I left. And then as soon as I left, I was contacted by the cold case unit um, mm-hmm. and they said, look, we've got a number of homicide cases we'd like you to work on. Mm-hmm. But we'd also like you to analyse some of the interviews, mm-hmm. like record, yep. uh, video yep. interviews, yep. and tell us whether you, you think the person's lying. Mm-hmm. Now, nine times out of ten, I wrote about this in uh, my first book, when we get a gut feeling or intuition, yep. Yep. we're pretty close to the mark. The yep. problem is, especially like your friend in the relationship, we don't want to believe something's negative or bad, especially when we're in the relationship, even though the signs or cues or the signals are there. Yeah. So what happens is we we start processing, we start, you know, coming out with reasons or excuses and so on. So they said, look, can, can we get you to watch some of these videos? And I started doing it and, like, I'd, I'd do it a number of times with videos, backwards, forwards, backwards. So firstly I'd look for body language, yeah. look for changes. Then I'd listen to the content and the structure and then I'd look at how they answered the questions. So in the early days, I go backwards, like one video could take me a couple of hours. Mm-hmm. Now I can do it as I'm actually sitting opposite someone because yep. I'll be looking for certain cues and signals yep. and then I'll look for similarities or dissimilarities in the way they respond. But I'll also look for how they answer the questions, how they use language and what their body language is uh, reflecting. But then I'll also listen to what we call paralinguistic styles. What does that mean? It's how I communicate the lie. Right. So I'll be listening to tone, pitch, voice modulation, response latency, ums and ahs. So holistically, I don't just listen to what someone says. I look at what they do as they're saying it, what they're doing. We know through research when uh, a person lies, their blink rate increases six to eightfold after the delivery of the deception. Right. So it's almost like, uh, oh, thank God that lies over. 
Yeah. So I'll look for those. We know pupils dilate. Yeah. Our reading speeds change. There's prolonged eye closure, which is indicative of uh, blocking behaviours. Mm -hmm. So holistically, we don't just look at one. We look at verbal, nonverbal and paralinguistic. Right. And who are you training with this? Well, when I first started, it was government departments yeah. and... Um, judges, would you have trained? Yeah, yeah I've yeah. trained judges. I've trained, trained barristers, uh, lawyers, attorneys in the US. Um, you know, sometimes they're interviewing someone in the witness box. Mm -hmm. They want to know whether or not they're lying. Uh, but more importantly, what the trigger, what is the trigger? What's making their change? What, what questions should I ask to hi highlight... Uh, any prejudice or bias. Right? So, 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 sorry, so continue. Sorry. Um, Please, and then it sort of went from there. I, I uh, was then asked to go on The Bachelor, you know, to work out whether people were really interested in each other. Yeah, right. Because it's funny, just on this yeah. subject, you know, um, when a woman is interested in a man, yeah. she will bombard him with behavioural cues that signify that interest. Right. The problem is men have no idea. Mm. Men don't know what those cues and signals are. I can go out with friends and I can see if a woman's interested, there'll be you know, um, you know, good direct eye contact, mm -hmm. touching, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, a good frontal alignment, mm -hmm. and there'll be grooming and preening gestures, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And my mate will turn around and say, do you think she likes it? <laughs> yeah, ah! yeah, yeah, of course she so, does, yeah. Anyway, so then... What, what, do, what do guys do when they like when they like a girl? Well, typically... It, Are they more sort of forward? Can you just, you know... Well, yeah. So firstly, they're recklessly oblivious to what they'll do. So mm. often they'll puff their chest out, put their hands on the hips, which increases the surface yeah, area yeah. to attract attention. Yeah. In some cases they'll actually point to their crutch, not yeah. even realising they're doing that. Yeah, right. Uh, and uh, stand upright. So sometimes you watch somebody stooping, they're all of a sudden attractive-looking yeah. girl and they'll yeah. stand up. Um Men will often you know, misinterpret a smile for potential sexual interest. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of things that men will do, but men are not as discreet when it mm. comes, you know, a, a, a lady will look at a guy and mm. you know, make some observations that men tend to like really yeah. ogle and stare. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so get back to the initial uh, question. And then all of a sudden I had uh, corporates, companies say, look, Look, we uh, would like you to train our sales teams on reading our customers um, because we're noticing that they're not building a good rapport. And, you know, if I'm interviewing you for a homicide or um, let's say you're a customer and I'm uh, telling you about a product, as humans we all exhibit the pretty similar uh, uh, behaviours. Yeah. The difference is, is like if it's, I don't know, if you play poker, uh, you have no, to, you have to uh, bluff um, the other players to make it look like you have better cards so yeah. they'll fold. So it's a different form of lying but the difference is if you're lying to me, you're going to jail. Yeah. If you're lying to a potential other uh, poker player, yeah. you're going to win money. So yeah. one you're rewarded for, one yeah. you're penalised for. Yeah. Do you play poker? No, I don't but I was on a show called The Poker Star right. and what they did was they got me to analyse uh, a number of well-known world poker champions. Yeah. Right. One of them um, was an Australian, actually. I um, uh, can't think of his name now. It just escapes me. The Lebanese? But, uh, yeah, accountant. Joe Hashem. Joe, Joe Hashem, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And That's what I was talking I couldn't remember his name, sorry. Yeah, and he won the 2005 World Championship in Vegas and I think he won about 12 million US. Right. Um, and he said to me, he said, can you have a look at some of my tapes mm -hmm. and tell me if there were giveaways? I said, yeah. Sure. And within a minute and a half I could see when he had good cards. Yeah. How? Subconsciously, we engage in behaviours we don't even mm. realise. What I found if uh, Joe in particular yeah. had good cards, he'd actually lean closer and sometimes he'd actually put his hands on the car, or, uh, on the table. It's like, mine, mine, get away. Yeah. Protective. Yeah. Whereas if they had crap hands, they'd actually sit back and push themselves away and engage in defensive barriers such as crossed mm. arms, crossed legs. So this is one of the problems with body language. People say if he's got his arms crossed, mm. he's defensive. Well, no, maybe he's comfortable. So what's important is not the position but the transition. What preceded that change in behaviour beforehand? If it's my threatening question and the person didn't answer it, then I see these changes. That's important for me. Yeah, right. So then a big question mark, why is he or she doing that? Yeah. I hope Joe doesn't play anymore because you've just given away all his tactics. <laughs> oh, I haven't given it all away but uh, a couple. <laughs> so go going back to like... Training judges, right? So then, why are not our um, and this could be a dumb question? I don't know. But why, why isn't the jury full of people like yourself? 
Well, our legal system's predicated on the basis we're going to be judged mm. by our peers right. based on all the evidence um, and they draw a conclusion. And, I mean, it's been, like that, as you know, for many, many years. Um, it's not a perfect system. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it's, it's like any skill set. Um, you know, we want to make sure in our legal system that, um, you know, an innocent person isn't wrongly convicted. Yeah. But unfortunately, a, a, a trial is not always about uh, the truth. <laughs> it's about who can convince the jury their side of the story. Yeah. So, and, and do they differ, the juries, between Australia and the United States? Oh, yeah. In, Europe? yeah. How? in what way? Well, you know, there are consultants in America who will actually um, sit there and watch juries uh, being asked questions before they're impaneled. Uh, they may ask questions about, you know, what's your view on, um, um, I don't know, let's, well, depending on what the case is. So let's say the case is um, sexual assault. Mm -hmm. They might ask questions about, you know, have you ever been out with a girl and, you know, you felt that she was giving you signals and um, you misread the cue. How they react to that question could be instrumental as to whether or not they have a bias or prejudice. Um, if you have a, um, let's say, a juror who may have been previously sexually assaulted, yep. right, may have a predisposition to being very biased towards. So the, there's a number of challenges. So they actually have jury specialists who will uh, specialise in that uh, process of reading uh, and whether or not they could be sit on the jury and uh, show no bias or, or anything like that. Right. Well, what's the weirdest thing or strangest thing that you've been asked to look at in terms of Someone like okay, well maybe not. Australia. Have you ever had friends go? Look, um, I confronted my spouse about whether he or she was uh, was cheating on me, and I <sighs> recorded it. Can you have a look and tell me if she's he or she's telling the truth? Have, yeah. have you had that? I, I've yeah, I you know what I don't. I've, I've had that yes, yeah. but I don't go down that path, especially with friends. I don't want to yeah. get involved in that. Um, in the early years, when I heard things that didn't add up, yeah. I would challenge them. Yeah. But with age comes wisdom. Yeah. Now there's no benefit in me challenging something like that. I remember I was in New Jersey and um, I went to a party and I'd, I'd done a number of um, you know um, uh, morning shows throughout mm -hmm. the states. Yeah. And um, anyway, there was one lady in this group and uh, she heard what I did. There was about 20 people in the room, and she says. Oh, look, um, someone told me that you're the human lie detector. She goes, I want to test you. And I go, <laughs> oh, this cannot end well. <laughs> and she said, okay, I'm going to give you a statement. You tell me if I'm telling the truth. And I thought, here we go. And she said, I cheated on my husband. I said, is your husband here? And she said, yes. I said, give me the details. Now, by asking her the details, I'm going to listen very carefully to how she responds. Now, yeah. think about this. Yeah. Let's just say she has, and I think she's lying. Mm -hmm. Am I going to tell her that? In front of her husband no. and nine, 18 other people? No. Probably not. No. Um, but if I do, let's just say I say I think you're lying, imagine the damage that's going to cause their relationship. Yeah. So I've got to be a little bit diplomatic. Sure. But if I'm interviewing you, say, for a homicide, yeah. I'm going to slowly shred you. Yeah. Now, I'm going to be polite in the way I do it. Yeah. So let's go, let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. So they bring you in. Um, can I give it, you an example? Yeah, sure. Okay. Give me an example. All right. So um, now I know you, a lot of your viewers might be international and overseas, but yes. there was a case here in Australia. Yeah. And um, uh, his name was uh, 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 Baden Clay, Jared Baden Clay. He reported his wife went missing. Mm -hmm. And he did an a interview with a couple of journalists mm -hmm. under his carport. Mm hmm. When I first saw that interview, it was one of the only interviews he did before he was arrested. One of the journalists was asking questions and he turns around and he said, uh, so he has children with his wife, yeah. and he said, I'm really worried about my children. Mm -hmm. Now the problem I got with that is what people don't say is more important sometimes than what they do say. When he said, I'm really worried about my children, what I would expect him to say is I'm really worried about our, our children. children. Why would, he, why would he differentiate between my and our? Yeah, he's already sort of got her out of the picture and now they're mine because she's no longer here. Yeah. So he knows that she's never coming back. Right on the money. Another case um, the, in Sydney, um, uh, Kaisha Abrams, a young girl, beautiful young girl, went missing. And uh, I always like it when they do, they get, um, you know, people in front of the media 
pleading for the return of a loved one or mm-hmm. someone who's gone missing. Anyway, there's uh, the biological mother. She's got big glasses mm-hmm. and she's got a handkerchief in front mm-hmm. of her so you can hardly see any of her face yeah. and the de facto boyfriend. And he's talking and uh, he says, uh, you know, um, she was such a, a wonderful child. Right there was is past tense. Yeah. If you've ever but obviously sp- they haven't found the kid yet. Not at that stage. Yeah. So one thing, and if you've ever spoken to a parent who said their child abducted, they will never, ever, ever give up hope until there's any evidence to the yeah. contrary. When he said she was such a wonderful child, right there, yeah. it's – anyway, they eventually found the child. I won't go into the detail yeah. what they did. but um, and, and they were charged for the murder uh, of this uh, young girl. Now, it's interesting because truthful people, like I said earlier in the mm-hmm. interview, um, will take ownership. Whereas deceptive people will create that distance, disassociation, separation. Bill Clinton, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss mm. Lewinsky. Mm. Everyone knew that he knew who the intern yeah. was. Why yeah. is he creating that yeah. distance in language? Yeah. Um, and also when he was pointing and looking the opposite direction, it was like a real disconnect. I, yeah. I never had a, a relationship, yeah. sexual relationship. So then it comes down to defining what constitutes a sexual relationship mm. with that woman. Yeah. Um, and uh, eventually, obviously, he realised. And here's a great example. You lie, you lie, you lie, you get deeper and deeper and deeper. And he was impeached. Yeah. So what happens is, and you know, how many times have we seen politicians lying about having mm. affairs and, you know, they, mm. it gets to a stage where they, they resign. Yeah. So it is extremely difficult to lie with believability and credibility. Yeah. When you get brought in, though, I, I, and, and, you know, in, in the interviewing process, now you haven't got the evidence yet. You know, you think you may have a suspect, but you don't know if that person has That's done it. That's not or... always the case. Sometimes you might have forensic, scientific, medical, cooperative evidence. Yeah. You might have real evidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might have documented it. You might have witness testimony. Yeah. Not that that's super reliable, but yeah. you, you, I mean, I would want to collect all the evidence I've got before I actually have a formal interview with you. Right. But if you don't have any evidence, you know, to point to that particular yeah. person, then. And happens, you, you know, and 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 you're, you're going, I reckon this this person's lying, right? I mean, it's not it's that that's not it, is it? They can't just charge someone because you think you know mm-hmm. that they're lying. So how Absolutely. many times have you been wrong? Um, how does that? So so basically, what happens when when you say, yeah, I think you need to, what, they just look further into it, or or have you said, oh look, no, I think this person is telling the truth. They leave that person alone. How many does that times, work? Many times. Um, I worked on one particular case, uh, murder of young Bonnie Clark. Oh, yeah. And some of the detectives were absolutely adamant um, uh, that Marion Weishart, the mother, mm-hmm. murdered the child. They also, Some of them also believed she was sexually abused by the mother. Now, mm-hmm. statistically, that's extremely rare. Mm-hmm. Very rare for a mother to sexually abuse her offspring. Physically, maybe. Sexual, very unusual. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I spoke to her and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer a policeman, so I'm not on their side, I'm not on your side, but I do need to know what happened. So I, I'm just going to get you to tell me in your own open na- narrative what happened. And uh, anyway, I said during the interview, I said, um, it's come to my attention that you haven't been too cooperative with police. Why is that? And all of a sudden she said, look, I didn't like the way they treated me. They mm-hmm. treated me as the, the murderer from day one and all of a sudden her language was mm-hmm. changing, her behaviour. Obviously she was angry mm-hmm. um, and she said, that's why. Now what do you think the police were thinking? Oh, you know, why is she clamming up? She's not saying anything and all the rest of it. So I'll go in and I'll say, I'll look at some of these interviews. Um, no one's going to be convicted on a behavioural analysis interview. Mm-hmm. We need evidence. Yeah. Okay. So that can be corroborated by um information gained from the interview. So let's just say you say I was here. Well, then um, I'm going to look for witnesses to say that you were there at that time. I'm going to negate any defences. I'm going to see where you were. You know, that's part of the process. But only through an interview in the absence of any other forensic, scientific, medical or cooperative evidence can I get that. So I'll use behavioural analysis questions. So one of them, and the FBI use these all the time, I might say, let's say I'm interviewing you for a theft. I'll say, Joe, why do you think someone would have taken that money? Now, if you're not involved, you may have a view, an mm-hmm. opinion or a suspicion, yeah. but you may not know. But yeah. if you're the person who took it, you may have an idea of why that person or why you took yeah. it and if so, what you did it for and where the money is now if mm-hmm. you haven't already spent it. Yeah. So I'll say, and, and I worked on a case, exactly, I had nothing. Um, I was going through a second-hand dealer shop in mm-hmm. um, Escobar and there were all these tap and die sets, like expensive yeah. tool sets. 
And um, anyway, all of a sudden there were three sets and one guy had actually put them through. Now, I said to the owner, I said, um, um, has, um, did he come in with all three of them? He said, yeah. I said, all right, now all I've got is a name. Yep. Now, it could be a false ID. Yep. Who knows? So I make some inquiries. I find out the factory or where they come from. I ring up the uh, one of the bosses there and I said, do you have a, a person by the name of blah, 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 works there? Yes, we do. Um, okay, um, my name's Steve Van Appen from Flemington CIB. I'd like to have a chat with him because I've found some of your tap and dice. It's down at a, a, a second-hand dealer place here. Is there any reason why they should be there and with this person's name? So he confirmed that that person actually works there. So I'm thinking, okay. So I go there and really someone else could have used his ID. Yeah. So I asked him, I said, what do you think the reason why somebody would actually take these tap and dice sets? And he said, I don't know, maybe they've got a gambling problem. <laughs> Right. I'm thinking, I don't say anything. I yeah. think, okay, where would that come from? Mm. Anyway, so it, I kept interviewing him and after about 15 minutes he actually confessed that he took them and sold them. Because he has a gambling problem. Because he had a gambling problem. Yeah. So often um, these behavioural analysis questions, well, another one might be, tell me, Joe, what do you think should happen to the person who took that money? Truthful people, depends on their religion, their, their culture, their background, uh, you will usually say they're not involved. You know, they'll be able to tell you um, what they think. You know, maybe they should um, you know, be interviewed by the boss or get sacked or go to jail or whatever their reason. Give the money back. Give the money back. Yeah. Come up with some justification. And that's a behavior analysis question. If you stole that, uh, how much of that money do you think should be returned? Mm. Well, how much? I, well, what I didn't spend. Correct. But a truthful person, not. Why would you ask me that question? Yeah. How will I know? Mm. Whereas the person who's sitting there who may have taken it, and I've had people say, well, you know, half. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I think good interviewers are, are good at reading people, good at asking questions, good at analysing behaviour, but also good at looking at the motive. If I interview somebody, and I do, I've done this all the time, um, I ask them, if they confess to me, and my confession rate is quite high, I'll ask them, why did Joe, why did you tell me about that? What is it about? And um, that can only make me a better interviewer yeah. if you tell me why. Because make no mistake, um, I can give you a psychologically justifiable reason for your behaviour. You know, everyone steals from this company. You're mm -hmm. not the only person. That doesn't make you a bad person. Mm. Compared to some of the people I've dealt with in the past, uh, they're terrible people. Yeah. You've, maybe you've made a mistake. It's like an olive branch. Yeah. Um, that's why they have erasers on the back of pencils yeah. because people make mistakes. Yes. You're not a bad person. Maybe this was totally out of character for you. So I'm actually giving you a psychological, not legally, but a psychologically justifiable reason. So it's easier to confess. We know through studies and research, if I blame you for your behaviour, I make it substantially more difficult for you to confess. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so let's get down to the nuts and bolts of this uh, podcast. And I'm sure a lot of people are hanging to, to hear this. How do we tell when someone's lying? What are the telltale signs? Well, there's many. There's not just one. Yeah. So holistically, we need to look for groups. So I, I like to divide it into categories. So we'll start with uh, words. I can lie with words. So if I'm asking you, uh, let's say, um, uh, what you did yesterday, mm -hmm. okay, I will listen to what you say and how you say it. So if you say, uh, I'll, give, I'll give another example. There's a homicide case um, where... Um, uh, um, there was a suspect, yes. his wife, pregnant wife and young daughter went missing. And what had happened was uh, reporters once again asked him, uh, you know, uh, questions about it and he said, quote, I'm really worried now because police are making inquiries. Now I'm thinking why would you be worried? Mm -hmm. You would expect the police to make yeah, it. Why, why would you even say that? Yeah. Um, so what happens is part of the processing, I listen to the language uh, and are they taking ownership? So are they using personal pronouns like I did this, I did that? I can always tell when somebody's making something up, if somebody's making up a story because what they'll do when they're making up a story, they won't use the pronoun I. They'll say went to the shop, not I went to the shop. They'll say what? we. They'll say went to the shop. I'll say oh, went. What, what did you uh, – uh, went to the shop. Oh, right, yeah. Rather than I, I went, went to, to the, the shop. Right. shop. So they're yeah. actually excluding themselves out of the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and I always look for uh, the term we – in rape statements because mm -hmm. we denotes what? Agreement. Yeah. If it's a forced rape or there's force yeah. or violence yeah. or th threats or fraud, then you won't see that because we denotes, uh, denotes you know, a certain degree of uh, agreement because usually most rape victims will say he did this, he made me do this, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. 
Um, so listen very carefully to what they say. Are mm -hmm. they taking ownership or are they creating distance? Are they using pronouns or are they not using pronouns? Um, is, are there emotions in the right place um, as opposed to feigned emotions? Uh, you know, the other night, I was, not that I make a habit of it, but I was watching, I think it was Married at First Sight. Yeah, right. There's one particular guy there. You'd have a field day with that, wouldn't you? Oh, that's why I was on The Bachelor. Yeah, you know, right. They wanted to know whether or not people were there to really, you know, meet somebody yeah. or to build their Instagram profile. Yeah, right. Um, is this prior to them becoming contestants? No, this is when they're so, on the show. So they're I on the show. PG and, um, yeah, because a lot of those shows um, are highly uh, uh, produced and are. highly arranged so yep. they know if this person is only here to build my Instagram, we're getting rid of them early. Yeah, but they're also making television for people to view. Yeah. And they, they, I mean, I think they're quite aware yeah, absolutely. that, um, yeah. you know, uh, people there for their own reasons. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't take long before things start unravelling, mm. especially if you're with somebody you don't like or mm. you don't want to be with. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the body language, and we'll talk about that mm. shortly, will indicate whether or not somebody really has feelings or mm. emotions because of the way they react. Now, so how people use words, what they say, are they taking ownership, creating distance, that's one area. Body language. If I have um, a, an attraction to someone yeah. or um, I like someone or, you know, I think they're a good person, you'll see the interaction between two people. I can look at a, a, a tape and I can tell who the aggressor will be. How? By the way they're reacting. I mean, uh, anger, flared nostrils, mm. clenched fists, you know, tension mm. in the neck, uh, pointing, you know, invading personal space. You know, these are all pretty well signified, yeah. you know, um, uh, virtues of anger. So, well, virtue may or not, but um, so does the action relate to the behaviour or is it contradictory? So remember before I said I'll baseline a behaviour then look yes. for deviations. So I've already done that with you. You, yep. you don't even realise I've done it. I'll, mm. We'll give an example yep. later. So that's important for me to know because I know what you do when you're doing certain things. Now when I'm going to get you to create a, a story or a false memory mm -hmm. or something, and I'm going to look for a differential between those two. Yeah. I, I don't tell people I do yeah. that. When I meet people, I shake their hand. You can tell a lot of, uh, about a person by their handshake, their demeanour, how they react in front of people. I can yeah. tell whether um, uh, they're confident, not confident. Um the other thing too is I look for high and low confidence gestures. Right? What will that tell me? If, say, for example, you're talking and then all of a sudden you're not answering the questions, there's masking, all those mm -hmm. face to, mm -hmm. hand to face uh, gestures, eye closing, prolonged eye closure, face cover, mouth cover, all that sort of stuff, ear cover. I remember I was doing a presentation in, um, where was it, Hong Kong, and they were listening. Uh, to a speaker, and it was pretty boring. Yeah. And a couple of people in the audience did that, not even knowing. <laughs> yeah. So they had to say that I don't believe what the person's saying, mm. or I don't want to listen mm. to what they're saying. So um, high or low confidence gestures at the moment, you're engaging up until I just drew your attention to it in an evaluation gesture. Mm -hmm. So usually it might be, you know, yeah. uh, hand to the yeah. chin, head slightly cocked to yeah. one side. Um, but then I look for uh, uh, High or low. So a low one might be rubbing the back of the neck, mm -hmm. letting steam. You know, politicians yeah. you, under you know yeah, yeah, start yeah. loosening yeah. their tie. Um, it could be something as um, uh, as simple as the defensive gestures, yeah. um, uh, moving back, moving forward. Um, what I do when I interview somebody, I'll actually mirror their behaviour. Right. So, and the reason we do that is a subconscious way of building rapport with somebody. Right. So I've got people in the interview room. And they're like that. Mm. And um, I want them to feel more comfortable yes. and relaxed because people are not going to tell you anything if they don't like you, mm -hmm. and, you and they don't take you into their confidence. Yeah. So uh, building the rapport is very important. So the third one is the paralinguistic, like I mentioned briefly, um, tone, pitch, voice modulation, response latency. How are they responding? Sometimes when people lie, they'll, at the end of the sentence, it'll go up. Mm. Um, so that could be important. Ums and ahs. Mm -hmm. Now, ums and ahs are not always indicative of deception because if I'm asking you a question uh, and you have to recall something, you may be thinking and you might just insert ums and ahs as a, yes. a filler. Yeah. Right? So where they're used and how they're used are important. So they're the three areas predominantly that we look for. Yeah, right. Um, so when you learned this, so the person teaching you, Are they are they still around today? Are they you know yeah. is in in your industry is are you like one of the top in the world? Are you the, the best? Is there someone better than you? Is there someone you look up to? Yeah, there's Tell always a bit people about that. who are more skilled and more highly qualified. 
Uh, uh, Ron Eddles from yep. um, uh, Homicide Squad, who's yep. uh, a friend of mine. I've worked with him yep. before. Um, he and he looked at the Canadian model. I looked at the John E. Reid and Associates. I don't like that. That's mm-hmm. the American model. The reason I don't like that is it's very suggestive. Um, did you ever see Making of a Murderer? No. Uh, okay. Basically, there was a young guy and the interviewers went in there and basically just bombarded him with questions and eventually he he admitted that he was involved in the offence. To this day, I still don't believe he was involved in the, the um, that offence. But what had happened was um, Ron was very well, Ron is very good at understanding um, the psychology, right? of what makes people do what they do, but asking yeah. the right questions. Yeah. And then, like I said before, instead of blaming someone, uh, using uh, a, what they call a theme to create. Now, the problem with the American version, in my view, is it creates false confessions. So, But what's why would po- someone confess to something that they haven't happens done? happens more than you think. Why? Like, well, what's the purpose of being badgered of that? by the interviewers for, you know, 12 hours straight. Right. Um, so they're not getting rests, um, you know. Uh, they're threatened. Now, in America, I can use trickery, deception or deceit. Yep. So I can say, you know what, Joe, I found your fingerprints at the scene. Yeah, right. But say but I didn't. But you confess. Yeah. Right? Um, they can use that. We'd never be able to use that mm. here because I'm right. actually lying to get a confession from you. Right. And I, I have a major problem with that. Mm. Okay. What were you going to do on me? All right. So let me ask you a question, yeah. a couple of questions. Do you think you're a good liar? No. Why? Because I'd like to tell the truth as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we know, as I mentioned before, people are not very good at lying. Yeah. It doesn't uh, mean I don't lie. I just don't, yeah, not, we all lie. not good at it. We all lie. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. I said before, we, we lie about different things. So I'm going to um, do a bit of a, a test on you just yep. to see how good you are. Yeah. But what I'm going to do is when I see things, yeah. I'm going to pull you up and I'm okay. going to tell you what you're doing. Yep. And it's going to make it harder and harder and harder for you to lie. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to make up a story from the time you woke up to the time just before I arrived, what you did. Now, I want you to include as much detail, content and structure, but I want you to make it up. Okay. Okay. So not one element of truth, but I want you to make it sound believable and credible. Right. So I don't want you to say something like I went to New York and back because yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. not believable. Yeah, sure. So I think, think what you're going to say mm-hmm. before you say it because mm-hmm. sometimes – it's hard for people to think on the fl- you know on the fly mm-hmm. and, and bring things out. So just make it all up mm-hmm. and tell me what you did from the time you woke up to the time just before I got here. Yeah. Okay. So I woke up. Um, I got out of bed straight away. Okay. Right there. There's a micro expression. Right. We'll keep going. Yep. <laughs> um, went to the bathroom. Did a wee. Then I went downstairs. Okay. So there's missing information there. Right. Yep. So. There, there probably would have been done uh, something that you've done from the time you woke up to the time you went downstairs other than going to the toilet, mm-hmm. okay? So let's go back there. Now, don't forget you're making this up as you go. So you Because every detail. day you wake up, yeah. right? So I want you to sound believable. So yeah. try, try to make it up because most people, what do they do when they wake up? Check their phones. Correct. Yeah. So, Which is what I really did. Yeah, I know you did. So, <laughs> um, But, but you, you're getting yeah. the right idea yeah. now. So yeah. keep going. But give me more detail. More detail. Okay, so I, I stumbled out of bed. Um, I went, opened the, the, the door, switched okay. the light on. So the response latency, yep. you said that twice. Yep. You engaged in a micro expression. You moved forward. Your blink rate increased. Keep going. Switched the light on. Did what I had to now, do. Now, notice you said switched. You didn't say I switched the light on. Right. Keep going. Yep. Did what I had to do in the bathroom. Washed my hands. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's another micro expression. You lifted your eyebrows. Keep going. <laughs> right. Um, Told you I was a shit liar. <laughs> Keep going. You're Dried doing... my hands. Then now, I... you, now you use my hands. Now, now you're more aware of it. All right. Well, I uh, went downstairs. Yep. Walked all the way down the stairs. And now look I went... what you're doing with your hands and your fingers. Are you aware what you're doing with your hands no. and your fingers? You're wringing them. You know, Usually like... when people are anxious or they're under duress, pressure or stress, they'll do those. And they're doing what you're doing right now, licking your lips. Mm. Why? Because when we lie, we feel uncomfortable. Our lips get dry. dry. Keep going. Yeah, okay. So I went down, opened the cupboard, the pantry, took out a bag of uh, bread and put in the toaster. A bag to- of bread? Yeah. What well, makes you say a bag of bread as well, opposed it's to a in loaf the bag. of bread? Well, because the, the bread is in this okay. bag, right? So then I put it into the toaster, pressed it down, then went and got the butter, took it out, got a knife ready to butter the bread. Keep going. Oh, you want me to keep going? Yeah, sure. All right. Then I put Okay, my... there's a shoulder shrug. 
Yeah. A shoulder yeah. shrug is indicative of doubt or uncertainty. Keep going. Right. Tapping. Uh, there's a passive gesture, by the way, uh, what we call a pacifying gesture. You mm-hmm. watch a parent when a child falls, they'll rub their back. It'll be yeah. okay. You yeah. just pacify. And you've been doing it a couple of yeah. times where you're rubbing the back of your hand. It's almost like self-assurance. Keep going. Yeah, right. Okay. While I'm waiting for the toast to pop up, I go and put on my sneakers, my socks on, then my sneakers to go and get so ready to go for So just by walk. you saying I go and put on as opposed yeah. to I just put on my sneakers you're now formalizing your language keep going right okay toast pops up i butter it put it together take a bite off i go i'm now out of the house i'm going to for a walk i go i'm for going a walk. to for a walk i'm going to go for a walk okay that's not what you said that no you said i'm going to for a walk i'm going to for a walk is that what i said yeah that's exactly what oh, i right. said okay now that language that doesn't make sense no, it doesn't make sense. No. Why? Because what are you doing? I'm getting nervous, trying to think of something yeah, to say. You're, you're, cognitively, out of breath, yeah. you're trying to make the story sound believable and credible. Yeah. But the problem is you're focusing so much on getting the story out. You're not focusing on how you're delivering that story. Yeah. And I've been speaking to you for the last what, hour yeah. and you, you weren't making those mistakes. No. But yeah. keep going. Yeah. So I go for a walk and I walk for approximately 50 minutes around the area, around here, around the house. Mm-hmm. Where'd you uh, go? I went down the street. Down There's your there. eyebrows again. Yeah, yeah. keep going. Yeah. <laughs> right down the street there. It goes on to Yarra Bend, I think it's called. So I walked up and down there a couple of times. Then what I, time did you leave? I left, oh, it was about 7.50. About? Or? About, yeah. yeah. What time did you get back? Uh, 8.50. Who'd you go there with? By myself. Anyone could vouch for that? Uh, well, there was another person walking on Yarra Bend. Boulevard, Bear Bend, or whatever, mm-hmm. but I don't know who that person was. If I went and retraced your path, yes, as you know, most people got cameras and stuff yeah. like that. Would I be seeing you on anyone's camera during that time? Uh, well, possibly. Okay, because, now you, know, you just shrugged your shoulders. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Um, I would expect if you went there, you'd go, Yeah, well, I walked there. Somebody's going to have a video somewhere. Yeah. Well, you didn't let me finish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying yeah. roasting you. There's um, <laughs> there's a lot of nice homes here and pretty much all of them have got uh, cameras, so no doubt. There's a couple of old homes down the end. They don't have cameras but uh, that I can see. So, But, yeah, you'd probably be able to trace me going all the way down. Probably uh, or I would? Well, yeah, you would. Okay. Yeah, if these people There's let another you. shoulder shrug and you licked your lips twice. Right. And, you, and your viewers will see that yeah. when they watch the yeah. video. There's another one. Yeah. So if the people let you view their cameras... I don't know, you know, uh, you might be able to see me. Uh, so I walked. Now, as to the witness, well, I don't know. I don't know the person. I'm not sure. You know, I don't have a really sexy body. I'm not sure I'm not going to be that memorable to these person, whoever it was. So now what you're doing is coming up with uh, justifications or reasons why you may or may not be seen on videos. Mm-hmm. The FBI call that a baiting question right. <laughs> to uh, determine whether or not you are actually taking ownership of that story. Now, what the viewers can't see is what I can see is what's happening with your feet. Because right. I was looking at your feet and um, your feet were actually moving all over oh, the I place. Know. You could see my feet. Yeah, I can yeah, see right. your feet. Yeah. Yeah, that's, right. that's the other thing. When, yeah. I, uh, uh, when I talk to HR people, uh, you notice now uh, they're lower tables and not desks mm-hmm. because, A, I want to see what every part of their body is doing. Right. And if you had to count how many times you've done that, reposition yourself yep. in the chair, especially when you're telling the story, yep. that's important. The other thing is earlier on before so, this So what does that mean, that I'm repositioning myself? Yeah, we call it the red anthill, where the questions become a little bit uncomfortable and right. they reposition themselves if they feel uncomfortable. But I did that while I was talking to you, though, while I was asking the yeah, questions that I'm... That's true. There was, I didn't feel any. Un- That's true. But if you look at when you were asking me other, and see, here's the thing, this is important about benchmarking because yeah. when you first, I was watching when you, you move a lot. You're mm-hmm. very animated. Mm-hmm. Now I don't know if that's part of your personality or whatever, but yeah, is, I can yeah. tell you're animated. Mm. What's important for me to look at is is he more animated when he's telling something that's not factually correct than he normally is. Mm. That's a deviation. But if, say, for example, you're animated all the way, then that tells me nothing because mm. that's part of your behaviour. Mm. What would be interesting, I think, is if you analysed my show, right, because I've got – I'm on stage for close to two hours, mm. right, but let's say you analyse an hour of it mm. and I gave you a list of gags that I do and I normally – I would do them – it might be in that order. Well, let's say for this exercise I do them in that order mm-hmm. or possibly you look at a video that's been recorded. Yeah. Now – a lot of things that I talk about on stage, I've been through. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a bit of stuff that it's just all bullshit that I just make up. Yep. 
Yep. Right? It will be interesting because I've done that routine over and over and over, yep. sometimes 160 yep. times in a year. Sometimes there are certain routines I've been doing for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And would be interesting for you to pick up whether or not I actually did have that experience that I'm talking about on stage or it's totally made up. There's two ways of doing that. One is to watch it. The second is by asking questions about what you said. Yeah, Obviously right. you can't do that when you're doing a, a yeah. stand-up routine. But typically one of the other things, we'll get back to that, one mm -hmm. of the other things, when I was asking you questions mm -hmm. about um, you know, when you started, when you left and all the rest yeah. of it, were you aware of what you were doing when you were recalling historical events? Uh, no, I wasn't I'll tell you, aware. You were looking, and we'll see this when you watch back, you were looking to your left. Right. Right. Whereas when you were actually fabricating and embellishing and that, most of the time you were looking at me, then looked down. So probably around about, I'd say, 70% of the time when you were recalling information, you were looking to your left. When you were fabricating the information, you're looking down, then looking up, looking down, then looking up. It's almost like trying to gain uh, the, the momentum of the conversation right. and then looking back. Mm. But also uh, your blink rate was very interesting because that changed as well. Yeah, right. If I was close enough, you've got quite dark eyes. Yeah. If I was close enough, which I'm not, uh, I'd be also paying attention to whether or not I can see your pupils dilate. It's pretty mm. hard from this distance. Yeah, yeah right. Jeez, I hope my wife doesn't see this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a lot of shit. <laughs> Well, it's <laughs> it's see, there's two parts of the process. <laughs> One is you have to lie, but and this is where people come unstuck because uh, a truthful person's story is usually quite consistent, mm -hmm. and you know they can explain it back to front, front to back. Nothing changes, but they also include how they felt with their emotions. You didn't include any of that mm -hmm. in that story. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, I would expect um, you know to recall something that. Uh, that maybe you know something happened along the way or something or how you felt or something yep. that annoyed you or yeah. something pissed you off or whatever yep. it is. Uh, and that's part of our normal process. Um, whereas when somebody is actually, um, uh, you know, making something up, it takes a lot of uh, processing mm. as, as we've discussed. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, you, you're, the, the eye contact, the, uh, you know, the frontal alignment yep. and all the rest of it, um, is totally different to what it was before. Yeah. And that's because you're processing and listening. Yeah. So the, the benchmark that you had, I mean, you, you know because, you know, you're an expert at it. You know I was just making all this stuff up, right? Um, but questioning is very important. Yeah. Too, because but, that's but only you, half the process. But you, 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 the baseline that you um, developed with me, was that before yeah. the interview even started when you yeah. were asking me what I do overseas and, you know, yeah. oh, geez, you're young there, how old are you and all that kind of and, stuff. And yeah. the other thing is I was looking at what your emotions were at the time because mm -hmm. when you were talking, you, you talked about the photos mm. behind. I yeah. said you look quite young in yeah. that image and all the yeah. rest of it. And I looked at your... You're lucky your I didn't knock you out then. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I still look like that. <laughs> okay. Come on, Steve. <laughs> so I was... See, now that's a natural smile, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it, exactly as it is at the moment. Yeah. But whereas if um, you were really, let's say you were annoyed with yeah, me, you go, oh, yeah. that's really funny. Yeah, so yeah, it would be totally different, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And it would be more contrived. Mm. Mate, Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Just quickly, I've got two more questions. What's next? Where are we going with all this? Because there's some technology maybe coming out, right? Yeah. Um, so two things. I'm working on a new crime show where we're going to analyse different uh, cases yep. that's coming up. Um, and secondly, um, I was... Uh, running some training courses in Dubai for Emirates and training their profilers. So what had happened was uh, Donald Trump mandated when he was president that anyone coming from six Muslim countries had to undergo additional screening, mm -hmm. which I did. I trained them. They're quite proficient. But then they said, wouldn't it be great if we could put what you do into some software program? Can you do that? And I said, well, sure. We just mm -hmm. need the right programmers. And so it started making me think um, everyone's different. Everyone reacts differently. Yes. Um, what does Joe look like when he lies compared to what Steve looks like? Polyg the problem with polygraph is the assumption is that person's heart rate increases, they're lying. Well, what if they've got a higher elevated heart rate mm. because they've never been interviewed by a policeman yeah. before? Yeah. So then I, it made me start thinking, well, what if we can collect controls? So how will you do that? I get Joe to tell me two or three stories where he's lying on video and then I get... Joe to tell me two or three stories where he's telling the truth and then I get you to tell me what happened on the day that the money went missing. What if we had the technology, facial recognition, that could look for those changes? So what we've done is we've uh, mapped 
the um, we, we call it face mesh with 480 dot points or yep. uh, facial uh, points. And I can tell by the microsecond how many times you blink, what your eyes do, uh, what your cheeks do, your, your, your mouth, all that sort of stuff. So it collects all the data of what you look like when you're telling the truth, collects all the data of what it looks like when you're lying, and then it autom- the program does it around about 1,500 uh, computations per second, which is much more than I can do because I have to sit yeah. there with videos and back- yeah, sure. artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, it's amazing. We, we've been putting it into practice. Uh, we've had Microsoft, believe it or not, contact us right. and want to meet with us and offer us uh, a, world, a global partnership. So uh, we know where, who knows what Microsoft want it for, yeah. but um, we know that we're onto something. So um, imagine how you could use it, for, say, for marketing or advertising mm. uh, products or, you know, when somebody really has a, a, a particular emotion. So uh, Professor Paul Ekman a lot of people say, oh, you can look at a micro-expression and tell whether somebody's lying. I don't yep. believe that. And the reason is is because it may indicate an emotional state at that time. It doesn't necessarily mean they're lying to it. So I wanted to come up with a technology that could actually collect all the data. What's specific to Joe? What does Joe look like when he's doing that? Because it may, you know, my blink rate may increase or you know, um, pupil dilation or hand-to-face, but you may not do that. So you're very animated. So... Yep. Uh, it, and it could also work the other way. When somebody's lying, they'll go into lockdown, which you did, yes. by the way. Because yeah. before when you're talking, your hands were yeah, everywhere. Yeah. I thought yeah. you were going to take off. As soon as you started telling me about the walk, you're, you're doing this, yeah. you're closed down, you're, yeah. you're, you're, your feet jumping all over the yeah. place. Uh, you're not focusing on what your body's doing. You're focusing on delivering the story with mm. believability. Well, limited yeah. <laughs> yeah. believability. Well, I can tell you that um, one of the applications for this technology that you've got would be um, with, with uh, wives who ask their husband, <laughs> does this dress make me look fat? Yeah, well, not necessarily the dress, but um, <laughs> yeah. So, I, I th- but see, here's the thing. Yeah. Right? I mean, imagine if you had a technology that could really work out. I mean, because as humans, as social mm. creatures, we all lie. Yeah. Right. So, let's say your partner comes home and says, "Do you like this dress? What mm. do you think of the dress?" Mm. And it's the worst dress you ever yeah. Uh, yeah. seen in your life. Do you tell her the truth? Mm. Well, we got a great. We yeah, we we we're open. I can I can tell her. Yeah. yeah. And but believe if, me, she tells well, me. What but she it can work like the opposite me. way too. Like, yeah. um, I am really upfront. I say mm. what yes. I think, and it gets me into trouble. Mm. So, me telling the truth often gets me into more trouble than lying. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And an example. <laughs> no, I, I th- and I think that's probably why a lot of people do lie because they've got friends or family members that it's much easier to appease them than to go against them because then, you know, if you if you go up against them, yeah, it could be months of. Of Arguments. heartache and an argument, and and I've seen it with some some people. Well, my ex, and when I finish this story, you'll understand yeah. why she's my ex. Um, uh, I lived in South Yarra, yeah. and men and women shop very differently, as yes. we know. Um, now, the way she shopped was almost like traumatic for me. She would go in, try uh, you know a couple of dresses, mm-hmm. and be there for half an hour, not buy anything, then go to another shop and do the same thing mm-hmm. over and over. Like mm-hmm. that's torture. Yeah. Right? Um, so anyway, so she goes, uh, eventually buys this dress, goes upstairs, puts it on, walks down and says, what do you think? Now, I said what I thought. I said, looks awful. Mm. Looks like an ABC test pattern. <laughs> and I noticed a distinct change in her behaviour. Yeah. So think about this. When I'm criticising the dress, what am I criticising? Her purchasing decision. Yeah, yeah. She, right. What's she looking for? Validation or whatever? Mm. So when I criticise the dress, how can she not take it personally? Because... It was her decision in purchasing right. the dress. Yes. Right. So yeah, uh, by me being upfront, truthful, and direct, and what do we tell our kids? It's important to be truthful. Yes. And yet, I remember being on a train once, and um, uh, it was about twenty people in the carriage, and there was this uh, young girl. She, I estimate, maybe seven or eight, sitting with next to mum, and this man walks in, sits down, and she says really loud, everyone in the carriage could hear, "Look, mummy, that man has titties." Now, she goes, shh, mm-hmm. everyone heard it. Yeah. So where's the lesson? You teach your kids the importance of being upfront, truthful, yeah. direct and honest, and when they are, they're criticised, sure. castigated and maligned for it. So now is the first lesson about being discreet when you lie. Kids mm. don't understand discretion. No. So they, they say it as yeah. they see it. Yes. They tell you what yeah. they think. So that's part of the social process in the ability to lie. And research shows if we don't have the ability to lie, we're more likely to be victims of frauds and assaults and uh, sure. criminal offences. Why? Because we need to protect ourselves. Yeah. On that note, mate, I thank you very much. i got one more question. What do you do every day to live your best life? 
nothing to do with what we've just thought. You know, just yeah. in yourself. I, I'm a great – have you heard of Joe Dispenza? Yeah, of course yeah. I have, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm Works a great, on the brain. Yeah, brain. Uh, I'm a great – Dr. Joe Dispenza. Yeah, Dr. Joe. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I, I, he has this thing about if you have memories of the past, you can't have a vision for the future. Yeah. So I always look forward and right. I always want to do something different. I always want to take myself out of my, um, you know, my comfort zone yeah. and because uh, obviously I'm a human behavioralist. Yeah. I, and a hypnotist, I understand that a lot of our processing is in our subconscious. 90, 95% of everything we do is on autopilot. Um, so I want to be conscious. So anytime, let's say I want to lose weight, if I go up and I'm going to order that cake, I actually stop myself because I'll think to myself, that's a subconscious thought, Steve. Yeah. Okay. Think about it. Do you really need it? No, I don't. And then I won't buy it. Yeah. So we have to be aware of what we're thinking. So, yeah, so my thing is building, um, you know, making myself better, building a future, looking into the future, not living uh, in the past. Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure. We could talk and talk and talk, but we have to cut it there. Thank you very much for coming in. Now, how do people find you? Uh, are you on, on social media? Have you got you, – you mentioned a book. What You can plug your book. Yeah, so uh, I have a website, stevevanapparin.com. Yeah. Uh, it's got a lot of videos where I analyse and dissect and, you know, yep. well-known cases and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, that's probably the best uh, place to go. Um, and um, also um, on Facebook and yeah. Instagram and all that. But if you go to stevevanapparin.com, it's got all the links you'll need. Great. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, Joe. Excellent. Jack. Cool. Hi, this is Joe Avati, and I am very proud to say that I am now one of the brand ambassadors for Elite Supplements. One of the supplements I take every day is Resveratrol, an anti-aging supplement. You know how they say that one glass a day of wine is good for you? It's because it's got resveratrol in it. But do you know how much wine you actually have to drink to get any benefit of it? 11 liters. Now, it doesn't take Einstein to figure out that if you're drinking 11 liters of wine a day, you ain't gonna be around long enough to see any benefit. So make sure you get your supplements from Elite Supplements, Resveratrol. Worked for me, look how young I look. <laughs> and I'm 73.